I don't think they realized how it would expand to the degree and, and how fast, but they were very concerned at setting the right base for it to do that. My name is Marilyn Craig Campbell. Today we've been welcomed into the home of artist and graphic designer Ingeborg Jurgensen Hiscox to talk about the history of the art gallery within the Stuart Hall Cultural Centre in Pointe Claire, Quebec. Ingeborg was co-director of the art gallery along with Mary Cornell from 1980 to 1984. Following that she became the director and curator of the art gallery from 1984 to 1999 and has played an integral part in the evolution of the art gallery at Stuart Hall. In your opinion, what was the value or what is the value of Stuart Hall as a community and cultural centre? Uh, Stuart Hall became the centre, first of all, because it was the library. So the library in itself attracted people. And then it was decided, don't forget, it was at a time, the early 60s, there were no Maison de la Culture in Montreal, in Quebec. They existed in France, but not here. So the whole idea to have an um, art gallery and a library and classroom activities and lecture hall in one building was pretty unique. I think the very history of the people that were involved at Stuart Hall reflects that because people came and brought their children to the library. Next thing you knew, they became fascinated with something else that went on. Then they started wanting pictures, they wanted art classes, and Stuart Hall was able to enrich the community in all these directions. Can you tell us anything about Vi Duncanson's connection with the library and the gallery in general? Vi Duncanson was um, very, very private very intelligent, um, formidable person in a way. She was um, a doer. She was, in my books, she was a visionary. And Vi Duncanson, with a committee, she had a terrific advisory board of local people. These were um, Nick Stoll, the architect, uh, Gerald Adjuado. These were people who lived in the community who contributed to the vision of having a really first class center for the community. I don't think they realized how it would expand to the degree and, and how fast, but they were very concerned at setting the right base for it to do that. So why, um, first of all, she had her contact with Mrs. Stewart, this is the senior Mrs. Stewart, um, May Stewart, they were friends and they had a vision of developing Stewart Hall but also keep it for the population, the park in perpetuity. In order to do that, there had to be money. So Mrs. Stewart was the money behind all the possibilities in a way. So they bought the building for the city and gave it to the city for a dollar. But the city could, it was damaged. It had been empty through a winter. It had been, the priests lived there, right? It needed major money. So the city was at the point of saying, no, um, we can't afford this. So by and her connections and her wisdom um, avoided all the other possibilities, such as making it a senior home, making it a hotel, making it whatever. I'm not talking about why specifically, but that was her contribution. She focused on an art center. And her referrals went to the Museum of Fine Arts, 
to Agnes Everington, the, the centers that were well established, those were the people who got to. Now, by the other little thing that happened, which grew, was everybody coming in the building, they said, where's the classroom? Mm -hmm. So Y comes to me and she says, do you think we can make a little sign, say, adults downstairs or whatever? Did she know you were a calligrapher? No idea. <laughs> So for me, the pleasure, just make a little sign, I did it nicely. Yes. <laughs> so next thing she calls and she says, you know, I really would like a little sign to say where the toilets are. So because I'm <laughs> spending all my time. So I did a few other signs. And then in Y fashion, she called again. She says, Ingeborg, I can't do this. Uh, I want to pay you for this. Because I want to feel free to ask you whenever I need a sign, and you say yes, whatever. So that was fine with me. And from then on, I did that. Yes. All the signs for the gallery, posters for outside the door, for in invitations. You have to realize there were no computers, there were no. Um, People used to make typewritten things and then they cut and pasted it and you had the lines and you made copies and the you know, it but it was my pleasure because I could work at home. They would deliver, the city would deliver the poster boards. I didn't have a car, small kid. Anyhow, long story short, I did lots of other things, but why was my guide? And the art lend, was that local artists mostly or not necessarily? No, it it actually started not with local artists. It was Ruth Arisberg who started it. Ruth was an art critic for CBC International. Mm -hmm. um, she came from Europe, educated in Europe in art history, uh, heavily in art history. She also did fine arts, but she was really not a producing artist, but she was the intellectual, very and aware of what went on before, what went on now, because when she got pregnant, the CBC fired her. Those were the days. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to always look back at the at the time. The context, yes. So she thought, okay, what am I going to do? The gallery, Y and Helen and Ruth had bought some artwork by finding exhibitions and so to decorate the offices of the city. They felt to elevate everything mm -hmm. to better standard. So we had some what was called the permanent collection, but it was not defined what a permanent collection should be. So when I was left, 
in charge of the gallery, you know, I had the art rental to worry about, the gallery, and the permanent collection, because the city gave a certain amount of money to the permanent collection. So I had to sit down and say, what should it be? So I did the same thing as Vi did. I went to the source. I went to Professor Lackey at Concordia, but he was living in Frankfurt. I knew mm -hmm. him. And um, I said, Christopher, how do we define a permanent collection? So we did, and we said it should be contemporary Canadian period. Like people call and they say, you know, I'm emptying my mother's house. She has all this artwork. I would like to donate it to Stuart Hall. I mean, there were calls like that all the time. You can't do that. You have to have a. They need to be curated, of, yeah. You know, to deal with it. So, but. Because the city gave me a small amount of money, contemporary Canadian, I was able to buy work from artists that I exhibited that I couldn't pay a fee. We had no money for artist fees. We had no money for catalogs because we were not allowed to solicit money because why Duncan said set it up. The moment you solicit money, you owe somebody. And we're yeah. not going and I went into, it sounds a simple thing, but it gave me all the security, you know, to say, no, I can't deal with that. We don't do that. I mean, we had, I was approached by a very well-known artist who had all these weavings and stuff. They were lovely. And they said, well, we would like to donate some to Stuart Hall. And I said, well, that's nice. But I said, the city does not, issue tax receipts. Well, that was the end of that, because people donate to get yes. tax receipts. Yes. I think that has all changed. I don't know. But the way by Duncanson set it up and her advisory board, these were rules. And I found those rules very supportive. Everything changed. I mean, first of all, Claire came in, the senior guard were gone. Mm -hmm. um, and then Claire came in. Did she want to change everything, or was she happy no. with the way Vi Duncanson had set things no, up? No, she was happy with that. <laughs> well, she she didn't come in and had to reinvent the wheel. Um, she was mostly focused on the library, mm -hmm. and it was one of the best libraries in Quebec. It was known for that. Um, and she was happy the way the gallery ran. She she was she was good. She was really happy with the way the music program ran. And I have to tell you, I mean, there are a lot of things that, that grew beyond anything that they would have thought. The music program, when Ruth Arsberg left, there was Nicole Pesold, mm -hmm. who came from within the building. She was a ceramic artist. She brought in these concerts that became available through the Conseil. Conseil des Arts circulating, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. they still do now. Um, one of the first shows I did of painting, I thought we didn't have a painting show for a long time, so I curated the show of painting. It was picked up for the Conseil des Arts, one of their first traveling shows of paintings. And those things take a lot of administration. I couldn't do that. I didn't have the facility to contact other galleries, whatever, so they took that over. And they were able to pay the artists whose work was in the show. So for me, it was a win-win because <laughs> I could give it to them. I said, here are the artists, yes. here's the work, and, and they circulated it. It went to Berbal, it went wherever they, it was great. But all these things, it, it grew within the parameter that we had. So I had my put my back out, and I was lying flat on my back at home. My secretary would come with mail, whatever. But then the show had to be taken down in Quebec. So everything was getting done, but I thought, I can't do the show. And I went in, and but it triggered for me. I thought, what am I doing? I'm ruining my health here. Mm. And there were other things in my life I wanted to do. So I quit and went to McGill and did my master's. Uh -huh. For how, how long were you? Two years. But um, we were kind of, I was kind of thrilled because I thought it was time to, I was still under the 
mental guidance in a way of the old team. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't call them old, but the senior ladies who mm -hmm. started. Mm -hmm. It was, and I thought, oh, a young Frenchman with new ideas. And I had just finished my my degree at McGill, and I'm actually sitting in my advisor's office when my husband called me. He says, "You had a call from Claire Cody. She wants to see you immediately." I was like, oh, oh, and I looked at my advisor. And I that doesn't sound good. Oh, that's not what happened. Well, I saw Claire, and you know, you always work two years in advance to book to your plan, shows, yeah. to plan, whatever. And um, it hadn't worked out, and there were no shows planned. But she had to fire this young man. And this, while he was in charge, he hadn't been planning ahead. No, he had used up the shows that I oh, had planned. Oh, riding on your coattails. Well, there are two things. My secretary thought she could see him throwing out files that she felt shouldn't be thrown out, so she kept them. I wasn't thinking of coming back. Oh, okay. My secretary wasn't, but she said she knew I would have to come back. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, I, I, I saw Claire and I said, you know, Claire, I don't know. She said, you've got to do something. You have enough contact. There's nothing planned. There's no, I had to let him go. They had to change the lock on the door. It's stupid. <laughs> and you know, so I went back to pick up my stuff, and there's Lynn's office full of crates. I said, "What's all this?" Oh, I just had a show come back from Australia. I said, "Okay, can I have it like now?" And you know, it's so exciting that you can do this, and it was great. It was fantastic. Next thing I know, instead of coming back to just maybe save the next two years, get something going, I stayed another nine years, <laughs> and within that time. The renovation. The renovation. Can you happened. talk about that then? My goodness. Um, the person really in charge was um, Nicole Tessot, who was the administrator and the cultural program mm -hmm. person. We worked very well together. She was worked incredibly hard. We all did. Um, and they hired uh, Julia Gersowitz, architects. She does historical. I mean, she's the best in Montreal, right? Mm -hmm. too. Um, so, for me, the the nightmare decision was the size of the elevator. We didn't have an elevator. Now, how am I going to design an elevator that is big enough for these crates coming and functioning? I mean, it was it was a big responsibility. Um, Julia Gersovitz and her team they worried about um, humidity control, which is very hard in the gallery to do properly. Um, they pointed all the bricks and sealed things off, so there's actually a slight film over the bricks. You don't see it, but I think it it did her in in a way. It was too much. It was too much. Um, she left, and Micheline Belanger, who is who took over. I mean, I go back. I'm so old. I go back to Micheline being hired to teach music. When she was pregnant with child, I mean, there was this young girl, Micheline, you know, um, and now she's running the whole thing. I know that you said often that you felt you wanted to get away from it so you could do your own work. During all of the time you were there, how much time did you actually have to do your own work? Any? <laughs> did you resent the time? spent at Stuart Hall when you could have been at home in your studio? Yeah, I think this is a very important question because don't forget, until 79, I was involved with Stuart Hall, but only marginally. Mm -hmm. I did all my own things. Mm -hmm. I went, I finished the Bazaar, I did the book, I did work for the National Film Board. There were always contracts, little things. With Pearson Airport? No, that came, that after came later. Oh, after you retired. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I was at Stuart Hall. They knew about the book. They exhibited the book illustrations downstairs. I wasn't involved with the gallery. It was none of my stuff, but they thought, oh, let's show. You know. mm -hmm. So there was always the contact, but I was doing my own thing. In 79, I had finished Concordia. I got my BFA. I was working part-time for a friend of mine who just sets for art portraits, painting. Yes. Which is, you know, a horrific job. I mean, 
I said to Michael at the time, and I was young, I think I was young then, and he said, I said to him, I said, this is a young man's job, Michael. I mean, you're on the floor, or you're painting with these big brushes. I mean, we did the magic food. And I enjoyed it, but I did it for, I think I did a year and a half, two years. And then Stuart Hall came up. And I was just at the point, I thought, I can't keep doing this. Scene paint stuff. Um, and Stuart Hall came up and I thought, oh yeah, part time. Perfect. Closer to home. Closer to home. Be home for the kids. I can do my own work. Oh. Huh. <laughs> for two years and realized it didn't work. Yeah. I think any artist, it doesn't matter what area they make their money at or their supply money, they always dream of having time in the studio. It's always there. Right? The fact that Stuart Hall for me was like a palette, like it was a, a canvas. It was my work. The installation was my creative work. There was a young woman from Alaska who did paper trees installations. And I saw this lecture and met her, and I thought, oh, this would be so super, it's good all. You just have this idea. So I talked to her after it, and I said, you know, I have this space <laughs> that would be perfect. Oh, never heard of us, whatever. So she says, well, I'm taking the flight back tomorrow, but if you can get me there early in the morning and I can catch my flight, I'll have a look at it. I drive into the city, pick up at the hotel, we go to Stuart Hall. I showed her what I was envisioning and brought her to the airport. And then when she left, she said, send me the floor plan. I will make a new installation. And we did all of this by fax. Don't forget, we didn't have no Not emails. Much. We didn't have computers. We didn't have by fax, back and forth. We created an exhibition. One show I loved, um, and it also taught me a big lesson to not be too naive. Um, I was in jazz in Edmonton. My husband was going to join me later, and we were having a couple of days in Jasper. And I go to this little house. It has a gallery, and there's a show I adored. It was small prints. Gorgeous little things. I asked this young woman there and I said, who's the artist? Oh, she says, I don't know. I only sit here on Sundays, which I knew the symptoms. <laughs> That's why I wrote letters for the volunteers so they knew a little bit, right? Um, which is typical of students, right? You hire them to be there. But They're you maybe... think there would be something up on the wall beside the work saying something? I had his name. That was it. Anyhow, before the internet and everything, I came back and I thought, I have to do something about this, getting those prints here. So I researched John Hartman and I found him, found his address, Northern Ontario somewhere, and um, contacted him. I wrote, I'm so and so, this is Stuart Hall. I sent some information. I saw your prints at, uh, in Edmonton, and I wonder if you could send me a CV and some more information. I got a lovely reply back and the CV like about this <laughs> thick. And I, I looked at this and I thought, oh, I said to my husband, he had so much for me discovering an artist. I mean, he had a CV with an exhibition record. Yeah, did. But he was interested in coming to East. Montreal. Long story short, we worked it all out. And I said, you know, I'm have so little money for each show. Um, the transport, uh, we have to look at this. Okay. Oh, he says, don't worry about that because he says, my father has outfitted a truck for me that I can put all my artwork in. And so he was going to drive it. He was driving it. He came with his truck and you opened up the back and there were slots for small works. There were slots for medium works. And he bought some big paintings that were gorgeous. I hadn't seen those. I was only expecting prints. And it was one of those shows. First of all, he's a hell of a nice guy. He's big time. You can see his name. Um, but the show was absolutely wonderful. It was just one of those. 
and I had no money. I bought one small one for the city, which was fine. But there was a big painting. Oh, I would have liked to paint. Anyhow, we've packed everything up, closed the truck at the end. I couldn't just let it go. I said, John, I think I need to buy one of those small prints. <laughs> And this is actually the drawing up there, the black and white thing, is I asked him to make some designs for the school hall invitation. But you can see at the bottom it says Stuart Hall and whatever the date is, whatever. But it was one of those shows where, again, I said, don't, you know, if you think you've discovered somebody, if he's that good, he's probably. <laughs> but I tell you, one that was quite impressive and it worried me more in retrospect after the opening. We had Japanese ceramics. It was a traveling show. And they were gorgeous pieces. But I displayed them. We had our display boxes and whatever. We still had the barn door that swept mm -hmm, out. Do you mm -hmm. remember that? I do. Pity that's gone. Anyhow, um, these pieces drew so much attention with the city and with the Japanese community. They used to come by bus. I mean, they would bring a bus from the downtown and bring Japanese people. And we had Mrs. Uh, Watanabe, who does flower arrangements mm -hmm. at Stuart Hall and mm -hmm. teaches it. Mm -hmm. She made new flower arrangements every week, I think. It was so beautiful. So then one time they had a group of ladies come and gentlemen. The men were all busy with the door trying to understand how that worked, never mind the ceramic. And I'm talking to one lady and she says, this is such an incredible experience because we never see these things close up. In Japan, they're always behind plexis. And, well, I nearly died. <laughs> Don't touch anything. I thought after this. We were insured. <laughs> the, the whole rest of the show, I was so worried because but then you have the question, you know, are you going to put a rope there? Mm -hmm. I, said, I can't do that. It wouldn't look right. Like every time, you know, sometimes I had two sitters there when there were more people coming. because oh, So easy to knock something After off. having been very relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that funny? But that's the part I love. That, that was my thing at Stuart Hall. And that's what kept me there. Because the moment I saw something or heard of something, that you get hooked. <laughs>